All right, thank y'all so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kim Smith, and I'm an organizer with Party for Socialism and Liberation. I'm an outside liaison with Jailhouse Lawyers Speak, South Carolina, and co-founder of the Soda City Bail Fund. And I'm gonna be chairing tonight's um, class, Party for Socialism and Liberation's two-part digital class series, Prison Abolition, A Marxist Perspective. We are so very excited for the first installment of this class series, Setting the Stage, The Emergence of the State and Modern Prisons and Policing. I want to encourage everyone in the class today. I want to encourage everyone in the class today to make sure they join class two tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 5 p.m. Pacific, entitled Abolition, a Marxist Perspective. It is critically important that we not only talk about a world free from prisons, but we understand why it's important to fight for socialism and why we fight for the abolition of prisons. The United States is by far the world's largest jailer with millions of people under correctional supervision in brutal conditions. The system of mass incarceration is maintained through a massive web of over a million militarized police forces, panopticon style surveillance and a callous quote legal system. Study after study has shown this system of mass incarceration has no real connection to its stated purpose of public safety. In reality, mass incarceration is an instrument for the social control of oppressed people and the working class. Prisons are not here to re rehabilitate or keep the public safe. They're here to isolate, intimidate, and to place fear in the hearts of black and brown people, to divide the working class even further, and of course, to make the ruling class richer. The United States spends over $80 billion per year to keep over 2.3 million people incarcerated. That number does not include the 60,000 plus juveniles that are locked away in cages as well. The ruling class has criminalized poverty. Even more disgusting and disturbing, they hoard the resources that the poor and dispossessed need to survive. For mass incarceration to end, we must make health care free and accessible as well as food and housing. These are basic human rights. The fact that denying these are not considered human rights violations in America shows us the little regard the system has for the poor, especially the black poor. Since this is a two-part class series, we will not be able to go into every aspect of the prison struggle, which can be traced as far back to the Black Codes of 1865. The purpose of this class series is to not only educate the history of prisons and policing, but to also understand how prisons are inextricably tied to the rise of capitalism. We will investigate who is being incarcerated, the treatment of people incarcerated past and present, and why the fight for socialism is a first step in building a world free from prisons. The teachers we have for tonight's class will be discussing the formation of the state, women's liberation in the prison struggle, the school to prison pipeline, and the history of political prisons. Um, just to give a brief bio on our teachers tonight, first we have Nino Brown, a public school educator and labor activist in Boston. He is also an organizer with the Answer Coalition, the Jericho Movement, and the Boston Liberation Center. He's a member of the Liberation School Collective and is an editor of the forthcoming book on Marxist pedagogy, Revolutionary Education, Theory and Practice for Socialist Organizers. Monica Johnson is an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation and the Housing Justice League. Monica is a regular contributor to Liberation News and Community Movement Builders newspaper, Grassroots Thinking. Angel Nalubega is a Ugandan-American communist educator and organizer from Philly. Angel is currently pursuing her MDIV at Princeton Theological Sem Seminary and is interested in Black liberation through the uplift of the international working class. Sean Blackman is a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, living in Washington, D.C. Originally hailing from Pensacola, Florida, Sean is a co-founder of Stop of Police Terror Project, D.C., a group that organizes against police misconduct and mass incarceration in the nation's capital. He is a proud graduate of Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University and is currently host of By Any Means Necessary on Radio Sputnik, a daily radio show that focuses on global social movements, international news, arts, and culture. Rachel Dumond is an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation and also a lead organizer with Cancel the Ritz based out of Boston. So first, we're going to get started. I'm going to pass it to our first instructor for the night, Nino Brown. Peace, y'all. How y'all doing? Um, my name is Nino Brown. And uh, I guess a technical question. Um, Kim, should I share my screen? And if so, 
Okay, I see. I see. has it. Very dope. So yeah, first I wanted to actually just start this timer because <clears throat> I want to keep myself timely. But uh, that video that we just saw from the Attica Rebellion, I think, you know, it's very inspirational. And uh, I think just yesterday was the day that that massacre uh, led by the state took place. And I think it's crucial for us to revisit this and look at ourselves in that revolutionary history, of course. Um, so uh, some of the things I'm gonna be talking about tonight are really pre-class society. And uh, this question of the state is very crucial to us, obviously as revolutionaries and communists in the belly of the beast uh, and Lenin, you know, took up this question of the state, uh, which was in some of the readings uh, for uh, this class. There's this pamphlet. I was able to luckily find this writing away at some used bookstore. It's Lenin's pamphlet on the state. And I wanted to start with an excerpt from it uh, to, I think, to frame, you know, how we study the state and how we approach it. Uh, Lenin is talking to students in 1919 at uh, Serdlov University. And he says, you know, uh, I would request you not to be perturbed by the fact because the question of the state is a most complex and difficult one, perhaps one that is perhaps one that more than any others has been confused by bourgeois scholars, writers and philosophers. It should not therefore be expected that a clear understanding of this subject can be obtained from one brief talk at a first sitting. After the first talk on this subject, you should make a note of the passages which you have not understood or which you are, are not clear to you and return to them a second, a third and a fourth time so that what you have not understood may be further supplemented and explained afterwards, both by reading and by various lectures and talks, right? Uh, so the point, you know, the Lenin, you know, goes at length to stress uh, that this is a question that, you know, you're not gonna really just grasp on one go. Uh, it's not gonna something, it's not something you can just uh, uh, learn through Instagram, it takes, you know, uh, study, a collective study like we're engaged in now, uh, because we want to build a uh, socialist hegemony and this idea that the police can be abolished uh, is becoming a hegemonic idea. Um, so we want to approach the class correctly. Uh, so um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with Antonio Gramsci. Uh, Antonio Gramsci uh, was an Italian uh, political theorist who worked from you know a Marxist uh, foundation and produced original analysis of culture and political leadership and his concept of hegemony continues to be useful for uh, uh, revolutionaries today uh, for those who seek to understand the nature of class power. Uh, this picture here is a picture of Gramsci from a comic book uh, and he says hegemony can be characterized in this way an agreement from the majority of society for the picture of life that is represented by those in power the values, both moral and political, involved in this agreement will be largely uh, those of the ruling class, right? So an idea that uh, the, the ruling class puts out is that police are heroes, right? This is hegemonic idea that we want to challenge. Uh, the ideology comes to be seen as evident or common sense by the majority of people uh, if it, be it becomes natural to think like that, right? Uh, and the consent is arrived at largely peacefully, but physical force can be used to, to, to support it against a dissident minority, uh, so long as the majority uh, acquiescence, right? So uh, this idea of the police becoming, a, the police being abolished, becoming a hegemonic idea, uh, is something that we want to build on and interrogate, because um, the ruling class in any society always puts forth its ideas, its perspectives, and its worldview as natural until they're overthrown and creating new naturals and new hegemonic ideas, right? That housing is a human right, right? A socialist hegemonic idea, right? That abortion is, you know, free and on demand. Uh, that should be a hegemonic idea uh, or is becoming a hegemonic idea. So the idea that the police, prisons, courts, the army, and all of these repressive apparatuses that make up the state could ever be abolished, you know, at one point seemed like pure fantasy. Uh, and it's often depicted by the ruling class as a near descent into total anarchy. Uh, but to understand the nature of the police, we have to comprehend, you know, what the state is and the role of capitalism uh, and what it's played in its development. And in order to find answers to the questions that we're posed with, we have to turn to history and not just, you know, dry history, but view history in a materialist and dialectical way, looking for the struggle, uh, you know, for production of classes, the advancement of science and technology, 
and you know, observing the numerous quantitative changes that have led to qualitative leaps to breakthroughs in human development. Uh, because you know, history doesn't repeat itself, uh, it rhymes at best, and we have to look to the past to understand uh, the ongoing processes that have shaped our world, and they are ongoing. Uh, and when we engage in history, we might be able to more readily discern the scope, also the force, the direction, the likelihood of changes uh, to come and be guided in our decisions and strategies and our tactics to what have you by the examples of our ancestors. So um, that's kind of where we want to come from uh, in approaching this question. And just to read this quote by Gramsci on hegemony, the supremacy of a social group manifests itself in two ways, as domination and as intellectual and moral leadership, a social group dominates antagonistic groups, which it tends to liquidate or subjugate, perhaps even by armed force. It leads kindred and al allied groups. A social group can, and indeed must already exercise leadership, i.e. hegemony, before winning governmental power. This indeed is one of the principal conditions for the winning of such power. It subsequently becomes dominant when it exercises power, but even if it holds it firmly in the grasp, it must in its graphs, it must continue to lead as well. Um, so, uh, Esteban, if you could go to the next slide, please. We're dope. So we're going to take up uh, what is the state and how did it form alongside class society? So Marxism is a science uh, and as a science of social change, it pays attention to the class character of any given society. Uh, V.I. Lenin uh, posed the problem most sharply in his 1917 pamphlet, State and Revolution, where he drew on the early works of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, and Lenin defined the state not as, a, as the political leadership in a given society, but as the organization of force and violence, armies, jails, courts, police, uh, all used by one class to repress and suppress another, other classes. And the particular form that a government takes, be it elected parliament or a military dictatorship, uh, has significance for the form of, you know, that class struggle may take place in society, but regardless of the form, which can go through many changes and alterations, the state at the end of the day always functions to defend a particular class in society. Uh, and as Marxists and as communists, we understand that only a social revolution can change uh, which class holds the reign of power. Uh, and in Engels' book, Frederick Engels uh, wrote an excellent text, uh, uh, The Origins of the Family, uh, private property in the state. Uh, and he was the first to, you know, put this view into a world historical context where he described the evolution of human society as a product of social relations, uh, you know, productive capacities as well, uh, alongside technological development. Uh, in particular, the gradual division of society into classes with a tiny exploiting ruling class on top, uh, that required the creation of a repressive apparatus right, to maintain and enforce its power and privileges against the lower working classes. And these organs of repression were used uh, in the interests of the most powerful or economically dominant class to suppress any revolt or rebellion uh, by the exploited or oppressed classes. So this is really just the, the, the thesis that the state is fundamentally an instrument of repression uh, of one class by another. Uh, and Engels devoted uh, substantial attention to studying pre-class societies in order to show how a society could be organized without oppression. Uh, and Engels also collected uh, evidence of uh, uh, social orders that were based on cooperation and satisfying human needs. So it wasn't uh, coming from an idealistic or unscientific uh, basis or you know, making these claims that in humanity is inherently good or bad or evil, right? We're not approaching as you know, police and the state and the army what have you, they're inherently good or bad, or, you know, they're good cops, bad cops, what have you. Because uh, even from that that worldview that I just spoke about that Engels uh, uh, use, right, the Marxist uh, perspective, uh, Engels showed that human beings are products of the social and economic system in which they live. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Next slide, Cameron. All right, dope. So um, Engels highlighted the work of this progressive scholar, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, and Morgan's research on ancient societies was the first to show how a well-defined social order uh, in cultures uh, was found in cultures with, with so-called primitive economies. Um, I mean, I, I really like to call them primary. Uh, they just call them primitive as 
uh, in terms of their technological development. Um, but I, I really use primary interchangeably. Uh, but Morgan emphasized that these kinship organizations, which he uh, described using the Latin word gens, uh, you know, was a type of social organization that bound people together by a common ancestry, typically the female line. Uh, this form of organization was virtually identical for the earliest uh, societies in ancient Greece, ancient Romans, uh, Native Americans of North America, and uh, many other uh, peoples. And Engels emphasized uh, important discoveries in Morgan's research on the gens in the uh, Iroquois Confederacy uh, in particular. He found that not only did key democratic forms such as participation and equality exist in the Iroquois gens, but in addition, they existed without the same contradictions found in class society. So there was no such thing as a slavery or inequality or poverty in these societies. Uh, everyone in society uh, could participate in the collective decisions of the tribe uh, and leaders were elected by gens to represent them in federal or tribal council meetings, uh, but their powers were very limited. They didn't possess uh, powers of coercion, only a moral authority, and they could be immediately recalled by the people. Uh, there was also a division of labor uh, between men and women. Men hunted for food, uh, gathered raw materials and fought in war. Uh, women took care of the home, prepared food and made clothing, and each took possession uh, of their respective tools. but everything was communal, including housework, and the division of, uh, of sexes did not imply a dominant or unequal relationship between men and women. Uh, and as member of the gens, one was obligated to help uh, protect and especially assist in avenging injury by strangers to another member of the gens. Uh, and this was a protection that was guaranteed to everyone, uh, but there was no obligation to fight in wars. Uh, there were no police, no judges, no prisoners, uh, no prisons, no lawsuits. Uh, and yet, as Ingalls points out, uh, you know, everything took an orderly course. Uh, weapons were not restricted to this or that special institution, like the police or an army, uh, distinct from the whole gens, and quarrels and disputes were settled by the whole community affected, uh, only as uh, an extreme and exceptional measures were, you know, was blood revenge threatened. Uh, and even then, a process of mediation was sought first. Uh, and if that could not console the aggrieved parties, the wrong the gens would appoint one or more avengers whose duty uh, it was to pursue and kill the slayer um so uh, uh, Engels really made a breakthrough and uh, you know strongly encourage everyone who's interested in uh this question historically to to read Engels text the origins of the state private property and the family um so if we go to the next slide please word so Marx and Engels also understood that this epoch of human development uh, could not be a goal for modern society. We're not trying to go back to the quote unquote good old days or to try to recapture. Uh, 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 Marx and Engels referred to this epoch as what they call quote unquote primitive communism because uh, although the society was organized around cooperation and meeting human needs, the society was characterized by you know primitive quote unquote or low level technologies and predictive capacities. Uh, it was a communism but it was a communism of scarcity and necessity. Uh, and Engels believed that you know, capitalism was rapidly approaching a state where the existence of classes not only ceases to be a necessity for the development of production, but it comes, you know, becomes a positive hindrance, right? We see this today with uh, the vaccine and the way that, or the vaccines and the way that capitalist property relations are actually hindering uh, a more generic vaccine being made that can be of usage to people in the global South. Uh, but intellectual property rights trump, you know, human needs in the stage of capitalism that we're in. Uh, but just to go back to our presentation, right, the capitalist class as a class of parasites and leeches, uh, they're no longer necessary for the development of production, right? Their order, like the order of the gens, uh, becomes uh, outdated through the course of history and is therefore doomed to fall. And Engels uh, points out here in this, this quote, the state inevitably falls with them, uh, Engels wrote, the society which organizes production anew on the basis of free and equal association of the producers will put the whole state machinery right this repressive apparatus uh where it will belong where it will then belong into the museum of antiquities next to the spinning wheel and the bronze axe so based on the obs these observations along with the study of class societies and their contradictions marx and engels were able to show the potential for society without classes or exploitation and based on abundance instead of scarcity, 
uh, and on freedom and planning instead of necessity. Um, next slide, please. Word, so abolitionist communism in the past is the future. So these are some images from uh, DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea or North Korea, uh, People's Republic of China, as well as the Soviet Union. I'm gonna can drop the links to these posters uh, in the chat later on, but uh, Marx and Engels uh, understood that this epoch of you know human development, uh, as I said before, is not some some good old days that we're trying to go back to uh, in terms of necessity and the scarcity, uh, but we're trying to build on the abundance uh, that we have from just the wealth that the working class has produced. Uh, Lenin says in chapter five of the State and Revolution, another text that I strongly recommend, he says that only in communist society when the resistance of the capitalists have disappeared, when there are no classes, when there is no distinction between the members of society as regards their relation to the social means of production, only then the state ceases to exist and it becomes possible to speak of freedom. Only then will a truly complete democracy become possible and be realized a democracy without exceptions, without any exceptions whatsoever. And only then will democracy begin to wither away owing to the simple fact that freed from capitalist slavery, from the untold horrors, savagery, absurdities, and infamies of capitalist exploitation, people will gradually become accustomed to observing the elementary rules of social intercourse that have been known for centuries and repeated for thousands of years in all copybook maxims. They will become accustomed to observing them without force, without coercion, without subordination, without the special apparatus for coercion called the state. So what does that mean to us today vis-a-vis -vis these modern conceptions of prison and a police abolition? It means that you know every society has a material basis. Uh, its underlying logic is dictated by the relations of production, right? Primarily the uh, relations more or less correspond to a definite level of the productive forces, how much a society can produce in terms of wealth, uh, what a, human beings identify as wealth and uh, of value. Uh, and the material basis for these societies did not have states uh, nor classes. Uh, there was shared poverty, it was a, you know, a communism of shared poverty, but not a modern scientific communism based on the advancements uh, of past societies and their revolutions, uh, and really just the, the vast hundreds of years of work that the working class has put into building you know, society today. Uh, so by looking at pre-class society, uh, where there was no police, there was no state, we can see that these institutions are not untethered concepts uh, nor phenomena in their own right, but they are tethered to social and property relations and the class and state are conjoined phenomena. The state arose to protect the property of the class that did not have to labor in order to live and abolishing the police must ultimately mean changing the property relations. And the only way that we can do that is through a socialist revolution uh, and smashing of the bourgeois state and expropriation of the stolen wealth of the bourgeois classes. Um, so that's uh, uh, what's you know happening inch by inch uh, in the socialist states that exist today. Uh, and you know, I definitely encourage Hermes to check out uh, just you know socialist art about the future. It's very you know inspirational as opposed to capitalist art, which doesn't make any sense. It's just abstract uh, and not useful. Um, so we could go to the last slide, which is just some resources, um, some text uh, that uh, are read and putting together this presentation. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much all I have. And I'm going to pass it off to, I believe, Rachel, no? Monica. Monica, my apologies, comrade. Introducing comrade Monica. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, let me get my little my little tabs together because I can only see my face right now. And not my slides. Okay, there we go. Um, so um, excited. Uh, thank you, Nino, for um, that um, background um, and that um, you know good information on uh, the development of the state. And um, so for my portion of um, the presentation, um, I'll be talking about, of course, women's liberation and abolition, and uh, you know what 
abolition um, actually means uh, when it comes to uh, the gender and sexually oppressed. Um, so I started here, uh, this um, is titled, There Are No Wealthy Men on Death Row, which of course is a uh, quote from George Jackson. Um, and I wanted to bring up the, um, what Nino already spoke to, which is um, that this uh, you know, world, this current state of things was co-constructed with anti-Black racism um, and as well as misogyny as male chauvinism. And in order to seek abolition, we have to combat the misogyny that helps to secure um, white male power and capital in general. Um, so from Henry VIII, um, with the uh, institution of divorce being created for him and Harvey Weinstein uh, wreaking havoc on many um, women's careers, uh, we see examples of men in positions of power making over the world and their image. Um, so we as socialist re revolutionaries seek, of course, to remake this world in the image of the people. Um, so if we take uh, Weinstein and another of the uh, Time's Up and Me Too, Know You, Bill Cosby, um, who I didn't want to picture here because, uh, you know, hideous. Um, you know, if we, if we were to uh, call our ideology or follow an ideology, um, that was something we could call, say, um, you know, vulgar abolition or something that we might have seen online. We might be against the um, imprisonment of the two. Um, and one of the readings I added was um, uh, a piece I wrote on um, Bill Cosby's conviction being overturned. And I think um, that that is instructive. Um, so if we understand that the, the, the function of prisons is social control uh, to further goals in the interest of capital, we can extrapolate. So if the statistics tell us that vanishingly few killer cops or rapey bosses are ever punished, how can the negation of that normal process through collective struggle be carceral? So um, while we know uh, the Times Up Me Too movement uh, to be uh, liberal and largely not a very liberatory for um, most women, mostly spotlighting bourgeois women, um, is a, it's emblematic of um, a progressive um, desire to um, take away the, 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 uh, the power of um, men to oppress and sexually assault women um, as part of the labor landscape for women. Um, so I have here uh, the question, whose interest should abolition serve? Um, if we want to uh, build a society, and um, if we go back to what Nino referenced with state of revolution, we know that um, in order to get to communism, we need a socialist state to repress the interests of the bourgeois while the working class, um, you know, uh, while, we, while the state withers away. Um, collective struggle um, allows for us to get different gains than what is usual and what the statistics usually show us. So uh, we need only to look at our um, Denver comrades in the Aurora police, um, you know, just a couple of days ago. Um, is it a win or, or a loss for the movement and therefore our classes consciousness and organization that charges against activists have been dropped and murderers indicted? Um, we know that it's a win for the movement. We know that um, the, the, the people involved in that murder um, are being prosecuted because of the outcry and the organization um, that our comrades put together. So similarly, I'm gonna talk about a different case and, um, and other, and, um, other examples uh, when we notice either, you know, um, or uh, we notice wealthy men being in prison for sexual assault. Um, that, is a, that is emblematic of the movement or organization of, um, of our class of oppressed women uh, doing something to make the ruling class, um, you know, shake or tremble. Um, so we also should ask ourselves, what steps can we take to materially deconstruct patriarchy? So um, of course, as, a, as, a, as Marxists, we don't mean patriarchy in like um, a liberal idealist way. We mean patriarchy in the uh, structures and systems that maintain uh, women and non-male oppression. Um, so I also added um, a reading from uh, Caliban and the Witch, where she discusses, um, Federici discusses the beginnings, um, some of the like, uh, I think she said 16th century um, laws that criminalize abortion. So prior to this, uh, you know, prior to the, the, uh, the consolidation of the state and the church um, in Europe, uh, those being um, 
you know, very, very intricately linked. Um, we didn't have laws that criminalize abortion. We didn't have um, laws that, um, there, are even, there were even laws that legalized rape and sexual assault. Um, so now uh, during this pandemic, we've seen the, um, the Texas law that is, uh, should be flagrantly constitutional, but beyond that, it shows, um, it shows and functions to uh, marginalize women, to keep women uh, stuck in a role of, um, of, um, of reproduction and unable to uh, have self-determination over the path of their lives. Uh, so in the beginnings of these laws in, in various um, places in Europe, um, we see it's because there was a vested interest in the increase of the population or a vested interest in, um, in uh, stymieing the movements um, led up by women who did not want to be, um, who did not want to be pushed into um, wage labor away from, um, away from prior, prior, um, prior, prior relations to, cap to capital and production. Um, so the, the repressive state apparatuses, um, the, the police, the prisons, the laws, are for a reason, are for a, an interest, um, of course. And so um, if we want to dismantle these systems, we have to um, do things and heighten the contradictions in ways that challenge and disrupt um, the, the consolidated power of the prison. Okay. Um, and also the sex trade. Um, many of us know the, the uh, the statistic of um, post the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the the levels of prostitution skyrocketed, um, and that is similarly because this is a um, when women are pushed out of the labor force and women are shoehorned into um, a place where um, where they have no power, um, there becomes both a, um, a demand for um, the, the trade, the buy, the buy and, uh, and sale of women, and also a need for women to do it because they're locked out of the labor, uh, labor market. So we can go to the next slide. Um, we can go ahead, sorry if I mumbled. Thank you. Uh, oh, not that one, back one. There we go. Um, so if we, uh, if we look at, uh, you know, the struggle in, very uh, in the same time period as Attica and uh, George Jackson and the, the roots of Black August um, and our uh, four, forefathers and the abolitionist struggle, uh, we see many examples of the personal system furthering the goal of social control by punishing the gender oppressed of our class who are certainly largely Black and Brown for failing to thrive while suffering abuse and a lack of resources and support at the outset. I need to speed up. Um, so, Right here, I have a picture of Joanne Little, um, who in uh, 1974, 1975, uh, had been in, in jail for um, you know, various uh, petty crimes, crimes of, of, uh, of property and need. Um, and um, in one of our Breaking the Chains um, articles, one written by Kimberly Smith, um, we have statistics that show that over 60% of um, women are in prison for crimes of property. Um, lesbian and bisexual women are eight times more likely to be in prison and um, nearly one in three are incarcerated members have been detained for sex work. Um, so Joanne Little was, um, was charged with murder for killing a prison guard who raped her and she was the first ever woman to be acquitted of murder and self-defense. Um, and Joanne Little was the exception that proves the rule that um, the thing that moves, um, moves the, the capitalists to to either free or to do to do anything is organized movement. So some of our comrades in the party now were part of that movement um, to free Joanne Little. Um, and when we talk about feminism and, and gains and all those things, um, it's it's a it's militant struggle that makes us difference differences. Uh, so I'm also uh, from Atlanta in, in South Georgia. Um, some of you may have heard of um, of the forced hysterectomies in an ICE. Um, in an ICE detention center. Uh, so in South Georgia, which some of us visited, um, we had a, uh, you know, a, a doctor who, um, 
was flagrantly doing by uh, violating and um, doing doing um, un, un, undesired uh, surgeries for um, both women on the inside and the outside in the rural community in which the prison uh, lay. Um, so that was not just a women's facility, but um, in women's facilities, off, more often than not, um, there is, these women are, um, they have failed to perform femininity. They have failed to be the right type of woman, whatever, whatever, and therefore they're undesirable. We have many histor historical examples of forced sterilization and a lack of control over reproductive, um, over one's reproductive system um, when criminalized, which of course, um, as black and brown women, we already have that layer. Uh, so we can go to the final slide that I have. Uh, slide right before this, this is mine. Oh, it was switched, sorry about that. Uh, this one, uh, we were there. There we go. So I just wanted to briefly talk about the uh, concept of the captive maternal. A lot of us might be familiar with Joy James and her scholarship on abolition, um, but I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about it in the, in the uh, vein of revolution. Uh, so of course it's been 50 years of Attica and um, we could ask ourselves why was such a level of brutality unleashed? And that was partly because Attica served as a, an example of uh, what can happen or how our communities uh, come together. Uh, under the boot of, of colonialism, of capitalism, of racism. Um, the Mystica video, which I didn't know was gonna contain that, showed that uh, quite, uh, quite beautifully, um, the care for each other, the, the common meals and music and all of those things. Uh, so the captain maternal is an ungendered phenomena that according to Joy James, describes the collectivist roles that colonizers are compelled to take to survive under occupation. And um, again, uh, I'm talking about women and my, presentation, but uh, it's a phenomenon that occurs in many, um, in, in pretty much all colonized, um, colonized communities at some point. I also think of uh, the Algerian liberation struggle here. Uh, so we first have the, um, this is a progressive, um, kind of a progressive uh, matrix for um, how communities like the Black community in America, um, Algerians um, struggling for independence, um, those inside Attica, um, you know, have to go through, have to go through, um, or different, different statuses and, uh, when it comes to the state. And we're talking about, of course, the capitalist state. Um, so, you know, through history, um, or of course we want to, as revolutionaries, push our class in the direction of the fifth stage of um, outright, uh, outright conflict and uh, dissolution of the bourgeois state. We want to rend the chains of ca captivity, and therefore uh, we must emphasize rhetorically and strengthen materially the organization of our communities. Now, of course, says we have to pick up the gun to put down the gun. Uh, so, in these uh, steps here, we have um, the conflicted caretaker of American democracy. So, of course, while uh, black women and um, those enslaved are shoehorned into uh, mammy caretaking positions, um, otherwise, other, otherwise underpinning. Uh, this American economy by uh, being free labor. And, um, you know, various, some of us um, are able, you know, uh, we have the history of passing all those things, are able to uh, kind of fit in. Um, you know, after so long, uh, we get into um, a state of protest, but there might be, uh, you know, the liberal protests that uh, look for a seat at the table um, and, um, you know, are easily co-opted. Um, third, we have uh, the Captive Maternals Coalescing to Movement. Um, a radical movement, which, uh, you know, after seeing the failure of protests that acts for uh, integration into, into a, col a colonial system. And fourth, we have Marinage. Um, after, um, you know, having a strong organized movement like we saw in Attica and various other um, Black liberation uh, struggles like the MOVE, um, the MOVE family and community. Um, and um, even if you watch like the Battle of Algiers or read about it, um, People, um, you know, the, the FLN and all those things are, um, you know, when uh, organization starts to come into, into play and marinage is, then comes from when um, we have to separate because um, a, col a colonized um, community cannot ever um, fit in well, fit in uh, swimmingly, safely, uh, calmly into, um, you know, a colonial 
uh, capitalist society. Um, and fifth, we have outright war rebellion, which is when those contradictions get so sharp at which, um, you know, things cannot be ruled as they were. So certainly um, I'm out of time and we want to, uh, our task as revolutionaries in the party um, and those who aren't, it's organized energy that has come out of um, all of the, all of the uh, captives that we, um, that make up the society um, since the enclosure movement, since um, before we even fully entered capitalism into something that can't be weakened into uh, break that break weakened by breakdowns in solidarity, um, something that couldn't withstand and transcend these prison walls. We'll hand it over to uh, Sean and Angel. Hi, comrades. Um, it's so good to see everyone. Um, my section that I will be talking about is. Um, the school to prison pipeline. If someone could switch the slide, please. Thank you. Um, so basically, I'm gonna kind of give you the historical overview um, and some key features of the school to prison pipeline and how that has developed over time into the system that we have right now. So the pipeline has a direct correlation to the rise in mass incarceration in the 1980s and 90s. And there were positive struggles for civil rights that uh, created a sense amongst a lot of people, um, not just educators, but regular working class people that the education that they wanted for their children should be different, right? It should be relevant. It should uh, explore things like ethnic studies. It should explore um, more um, uh, content that actually taught students how to learn and engage rather than to uh, kind of be further cogs in the machine. Um, and it had caused many people to kind of feel hopeful in a post-integration education system that uh, students would grow and learn, um, and especially black and brown students would have better academic outcomes in a post-integration um, school system. However, because of the war on drugs um, and the kind of increased organized, right, uh, kind of reaction by the state um, towards uh, any kind of progressive movement uh, that led to increased surveillance. And we see during this kind of rise to the schools of prison pipeline that this surveillance isn't just in neighborhoods in particular. Um, but it's inside the schools and the classrooms themselves. Could you please switch the next slide? Thank you. So um, there's this thing that comes up called zero tolerance policies. And these are kind of brought as an idea first in the 1980s to reduce drug use in schools. Um, this kind of sh shifted over time uh, in the 1990s and it spread more wildly with acts like the Gun Free Schools Act, which was adopted in 1995, which I believe was before Columbine. Um, but it was an idea that if you sentence students that are caught with a weapon, they'd get suspended. And then the idea was to um, kind of isolate those particular students. They're kind of seeing if the conception was, if you punish students for these small offenses, it's very similar to this method of um, zero po tolerance policies are very similar to the method of broken windows policing, right? Where if you punish people for the very small things, you're gonna think that it'll discourage more serious crimes. However, um, with zero po tolerance policies, because there are these small things that can suddenly become criminalized, it ends up uh, increasing the amount of interactions kids have with um, the system, right? Uh, I was a teacher for about three years and my school had a zero tolerance policy. So if one of my students uh, was talking back and if you didn't resolve that conflict in class, you could, um, in theory, ask a police officer to come in the room and to talk to the child, right? Um, so you're kind of, reacting to situations that could have been dealt with interpersonally, teacher to student, 
Um, and you're kind of turning it into, oh, well, if you talk back, if you throw a pencil, if you fight, um, if you even, you know, wear a certain hairstyle that isn't against, that goes against school policy, um, you could receive detention, school out of school suspension or in school suspension, or even be expelled. And so what that leads to is students who are spending more time out of school um, for these small infractions. Uh, and that ends up put oftentimes pushing kids outside into um, interactions with the police. Um, or in school, it will have uh, situations where kids will end up interacting with the school resource officers within their schools. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so school resource officer, officers um, are something that I at least encountered in public schools. Um, after Columbine and other school shootings, government officials, instead of kind of looking at, okay, what are the root causes of this kind of trend of violence, right? Or how can we further support students? They thought that they could bring police officers and to provide safety for students in schools. Um, and so from about 1997 to 2007, the number of school resource officers, those are your regular, they're your regular kind of rank and file police officers that they're appointed to schools, um, that increased by a third. And in 2011 to 2012, when I was in high school, um, about uh, 92,000 students were arrested in school. Um, and so that's those situations where you have a child that um, might not be responsive or might have a kind of what you can refer to as like a kind of behavior um, situation. And instead of kind of training teachers to handle those situations or, um, you know, trying to find ways of integrating restorative justice, different things like that, um, they kind of treat these very low level violations and then turn that into criminalized acts. Um, and what happens when students end up uh, encountering SROs, student, uh, school resource officers, that officer arrests them and then takes them to juvenile court. And there are some uh, cities that and um, states that are kind of trying to address this, that are trying to change the system. But for many states in the United States, um, kids as young as 12 are encountering uh, the, the criminal justice system um, because of very small situations. Things that, that could have been handled by a teacher are suddenly being ha handled by a police officer. And then that ends up bringing children into uh, the kind of the early, at an early age into being criminalized themselves. Next slide, please. So the kind of history of uh, the school to prison pipeline is directly connected to the rise in mass, mass incarceration because they're kind of, the state was kind of seeing that you could inter integrate police into the schools. You could try to find ways of pushing populations or further kind of surveilling populations like black and brown people keeping them from accessing resources and academic support um, by just putting more and more police officers in the schools. Um, and that kind of perpetuates the cycle of incarceration that then when, by the time that they're adults, they've already had a record um, and in many uh, options, many uh, instances um, for these students, they don't end up getting the support that they need. Um, and the school to prison pipeline is like kind of, as Sean will kind of elaborate more off of, uh, has very clear race and class, um, race and class uh, connections. Yeah, thanks a lot, Angel. Um, so yeah, like, like you were saying, I mean, when we look at this phenomena of the school to prison pipeline, there is uh, a clear and pronounced uh, race and class character to it. And Angel made you know, a very important point in her presentation when she noted that 
the acceleration of policing and the expansion of surveillance in schools brings poor working and oppressed youth into contact with the criminal legal system at an early age. And this is no accident. And so the criminalization aimed at black students and students of color, these you know, discrepancies and dis, uh, disparities and, and punishments and suspension and things like this, uh, is motivated by white supremacy, which then justifies the policing and incarceration of those same young people. And so this allows uh, the capitalist system to basically create like a farming system where they plant the seeds for their future crop of super exploited prison labor. And that's why they got to get them as early as possible. So, you know, we should be clear that, you know, school to prison pipeline is at its base, another form of capitalist exploitation. And I mean, you know, the system's so cruel, so ruthless that not even children are safe from it in their schools. And so what does this look like by the numbers? According to the sentencing project, even though black youth only comprise about 15% of all young people in the country, they comprise 41% of people incarcerated in juvenile facilities and are more than four times as likely to be detained as their white counterparts. Latin youth are 28% more likely to be detained than their white counterparts and indigenous youth are three times as likely to be detained in youth facilities as their white counterparts. So here we see the sort of uh, interwoven ravages of genocide, slavery, and colonialism coming to bear in the super exploitation of literal children. And there's a direct connection to this pipeline and the history of public schools as we know them in the United States. Because public schools first emerged in this country in the 19th century, not to produce uh, politically savvy, well-informed critical thinkers, but to basically prepare poor and working class youth with technical and manual skills so they could go on to join what was then a growing labor force, of course, so the ruling class could benefit from this rise in productivity. And I would argue that to this day, uh, schools can be one of the earliest centers for uh, capitalist indoctrination and learning this rigid uh, authoritarian style of, of discipline. I mean, I remember when I was in elementary school, they even taught you how to sit. You know, you had to have your legs together, you know, hands uh, neatly placed in front of you, shoulders back, chin up. This is how they, you know, knew you were attentive. You know what I mean? So it's almost like you sort of get introduced to that worker boss dynamic in, in some of our earliest uh, uh, educational experiences. But this concept of intentionally molding the next generation of exploited workers is a big part of what undergirds the school to prison pipeline, particularly as over time, millions of jobs were outsourced and in some cases outright eliminated uh, automation starts to take hold with the globalization of labor and things like this. And while some working class youth were able to make their way to college, you know, many others were forced into low wage labor and, and unemployment. So while more affluent communities were able to more consistently send their young folks to higher education, poor communities and communities of color were met instead with these forces of state repression that we've been discussing. And uh, education in capitalist America is uh, completely different than what we see in socialist countries like Cuba, for instance, where education is free up to the university level. And a matter of fact, one of the first major campaigns Cuba undertook following the uh, triumph of the revolution was its uh, nationwide literacy program. And Fidel Castro himself once said that revolution and education are the same thing. And so ultimately, we will have to completely overturn this capitalist system if we want to keep generation after generation of young people from being subject to this legal slavery. And from there, I, I believe I'll be passing it to Rachel. Yes, thank you, Sean. Uh, we could go to the next slide. 
All right, peace everybody. Again, my name is Rachel and I'm an organizer with the PSL in Boston. I'm definitely excited to be able to present on this important class series tonight with y'all. I'll be closing us out on the topic of political prisoners. Um, we can go to the next slide. So to start, it's worth diving into what is a political prisoner. As has already been discussed tonight, prisons are utilized by the US capitalist state as a form of social control. Rarely are they used to punish the folks who actually deserve to be punished for exploiting and wreaking havoc on our communities at home and abroad. Instead, people who commit petty crimes, those actions that are characterized as crimes by the US state itself, unemployed people, and mentally ill people are tossed behind bars. This in itself can and should be considered political, a political issue. Why is it that US prisons are holding grounds of the poor and oppressed people across this country? That is political. But when we talk about political prisoners, we need something specific. Angela Davis once characterized political prisoners as those who have violated the unwritten law, which prohibits disturbances and upheavals in the status quo of exploitation and racism. Political prisoners are in reality rarely guilty of any real crime other than their actions to organize, educate, and agitate with the people against the systems of capitalism, racism, sexism, et cetera, which we know is considered a crime in the eyes of the state. Often those locked up for their political activity have imposed upon them some heinous crimes and charges for which there is no real evidence for. But the US state needs some reason to defend why they have locked up our comrades and thrown away the keys indefinitely because the United States denies that it holds political prisoners at all. We can go to the next slide. The 60s, 70s, and 80s were a hotbed for political organizing, as I'm sure we're all aware. Uh, national sovereignty movements like the Black Liberation and Puerto Rican Liberation Movements the women's and LGBTQ movements and the anti-war movement were all on the rise during this time period. And we should know that organizing amongst the people never goes uncontested by the US capitalist state. Throughout the first and second terms of the Reagan administration, which was 1980 and 1984, measures to dismantle efforts and organizations that were antagonistic to the capitalist US government were greatly increased and expanded. During this time period alone, over 150 political prisoners were held, tried, and ultimately served sentences. And today, many political prisoners from this Reagan era, era still remain behind bars. In 1986, uh, we saw the creation of the first high security unit. It was a never before seen correctional facility in the underground of the Lexington, Kentucky Federal Penitentiary that would ultimately set the stage for a new abusive treatment of political movements by the US criminal justice system. The 16 bed high security unit or HSU or often referred to as the SHU, functioned completely separate from the main arm of the prison, which was a huge departure from the short term punitive purpose of segregating housing units in most US prisons at the time. The first HSU grew out of a a desire to primarily detain women, women freedom fighters from the aforementioned movements of the 60s and 70s. They were labeled as the most violence prone or escape prone as a result of their histories associated with political movements and were marked as terrorists. With the development of this first shoe, black, brown and working class women activists were turned into political prisoners criminalized as a result of their tireless struggle for political and economic freedom. We can go to the next slide. And we already know how bad the conditions in US prisons are. Quite frankly, they're sanctuaries of abuse of poor and working class people. The SHU took these conditions we know and despise so well a step further. And because of their special incapacitation model, this new form of abuse was largely both physically and mentally out of the minds of the broad US population. 
utilizing tools of extensive surveillance and sensory deprivation in attempts of completely incapacitating its inhabitants, the SHU, which was devoid of a stated policy for the incarcerated to even earn their way out, came with an undefined length of stay. Political prisoners have faced some of the most brutal forms of mental, emotional, and physical manipulation. And historically, women political prisoners, to no surprise, face added special oppressions due to the sexist elements of the carceral system in the US state. This quote unquote female terrorist has been characterized as a stronger threat to the order of the prison system, which resulted in harsher authoritarian elements to the already strict surveillance, in addition to, of course, regular sexual abuse and exploitation. This Lexington HSU was ultimately shut down just two years after its creation in 1988, after Amnesty International declared it, quote, deliberately and gratuitously oppressive. Uh, but that did not stop the characteristics of this model from spreading to over 60 prisons across the United States and the world. It is important to point out, though, that regardless of whether political prisoners are locked away in the SHU or elsewhere, special segregation measures are taken to isolate them from the general prison population. This is to limit the potential of creating a widespread breeding ground for radical ideas and political organizing, which we know that the US capitalist state fears so deeply. Why else would they be taking such extensive measures uh, to imprison and isolate those who have righteously engaged in the fight for freedom, right? And we can look to the case of George Jackson as an example. George Jackson entered prison as a supposedly petty thief, but through his prison experience and through study became an agitator in prison. Out of his 11 years incarcerated, he spent seven of them in solitary and was murdered in prison, a revolutionary who had unshakable impacts on the movement for liberation today. That is exactly what the US state fears. You can go to the next slide. The US state isn't the only state to hold political prisoners. We would be remiss if we failed to mention the illegitimate state of Israel, its occupation of Palestine, and the thousands of Palestinian freedom fighters who have been locked behind bars for largely the same reasons of those who have fought here in the United States. Most Palestinian prisoners are, in fact, political prisoners due to the decades long struggle being waged for a free Palestine and the subsequent punished punishment faced for it. As of last week, September 8th, some 4,600, 4,600 uh, Palestinians are currently imprisoned by Israel's occupying army. And of those 4,600, 200 are children and over 500 are being held in administrative detention, meaning that they're being held without charge or trial for months or even years, just to the discretion of this Israeli so-called state. And since 1967, Israel has imprisoned more than 700,000 Palestinians from the occupied territories, many of which have been held illegally, um, according to international law, inside of supposed Israel. It is critical that we recognize the inherent connections between the struggles and between our enemies, both here and abroad. Black and Palestinian liberation movements have a robust and dynamic history of solidarity and the struggles against white supremacy and imperialism. From Ferguson to Palestine, we must continue to deepen the solidarity between our struggles as we fight the occupying state forces that ravage and destroy our communities and lock up our neighbors and our freedom fighters. We can go to the, the last slide or the next slide, I mean. Now to close us out, I wanna make one thing clear that the making of political prisoners is not some relic of the past. Any one of us on this Zoom tonight could become a political prisoner. There are people, comrades in the struggle against racism and white supremacy who have been in prison for decades for engaging in the same exact fight that we are in today. We walk in their footsteps and we must uplift their names, their stories, struggles, and plights in our movements for liberation today. And as our sister, Sophia Bukhari, who's a late Black Panther, former political prisoner, and a co-founder of the Jericho Movement, 
which is a movement to free political prisoners in the United States, once wrote that, quote, it is not possible to talk about a movement for liberation if you fail to liberate people who are incarcerated as a result of that liberation struggle. The only way we're gonna win a world free from capitalist prisons is if we build an organized and unified movement to free our incarcerated comrades and siblings. And we like to say, what's the call? Free them all. I'm gonna pass it back to Kim, thank you. So in the last like about 15 minutes, we just wanna go around and share from your groups, just some of the answers to the questions. So, it, and just also talk about some of the comments that came to mind. And if you have any questions, we ask that whatever questions that y'all thought about to like, to bring them back to tomorrow's class. Cause tomorrow we're gonna have an open question and answer period with teachers. So right now we just wanna hear your answers to the questions that we sent you to in groups. So if anybody wanted to volunteer to go first. Word, peace. So uh, my group, we uh, discussed <clears throat> the first question of, the, the captain maternal and uh, we talked about how, you know, the fact that the United States, uh, well, as prisons, uh, they mete out violence, you know, just as brutally uh, against men and women and gender nonconforming people. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we discussed how, you know, and connected it to uh, uh, Angela Davis's first chapter in Women Racing Class, where she talks about how you know, under slavery, um, uh, enslaved Africans were just as seen as like labor units <clears throat> and really mules of the world and not necessarily as human human beings that would be ascribed, you know, gender uh, and its constraints like manhood and femininity, what have you. So we see like black women building railroads, doing all types of work that was you know, not dainty for like Southern bells or what have you. Uh, and yeah, that, that, that the, the sheer brutality and the nature of uh, national oppression, uh, it goes beyond the gender binary. <clears throat> and similarly in prisons, uh, the all types of, you know, physical and uh, psychological uh, and sexual violence goes on in prisons, uh, men's prisons, women's prisons. Um, and uh, folks also mentioned that the the fact that the United States is colonized land, and that you know uh, the the fact that um, that's you know central to the fact that the United States maintains itself through the usage of prisons to quote unquote correct itself. Uh, but you know we see <clears throat> the sterilization of you know Puerto Rican women and incarceration of Palestinian women and children, um, and that's kind of why it goes beyond the gender binary is because it's. It's a uh, it's national oppression uh, and colonization, which affects the all classes, uh, the entire nation, all the people. Um, we didn't really talk so much about <clears throat> the other questions, but um, in a nutshell, those are some of the major things that we discussed. Um, also, I don't know if anyone else wants to add, wants to add on. I'm probably missing out some other things. Um, so our group talked a lot about folks were really, you know, affected or thought it was definitely helpful to talk about like the school to prison pipeline and, you know, seeing that um, in their own experiences to like the violence of like school resource officers. Um, and also about, you know, the criminalization that, um, to, that kind of like justifies or is kind of like self justifying in, uh, of, or kind of locks people in like the cycle of um, incarceration or just like kind of sets people up for failure. And yeah, we also talked about um, like uh, reproductive work and how that's like um, commodified differently or exploits people in different ways. Nice, Sarah, then Preeti. Hey y'all, yeah, um, we were able to kind of talk the most about the second question, which was how would you compare and contrast the pre-class society, primitive primary, primary communism to post-socialist advanced scientific communism? Do communists propose that we return to the past communism before class society? Why or why not? Um, there was kind of like an, a, general, a general agreement that 
Um, no, that is not something that we are, um, you know, making a large call for. Um, but we did talk about some of the conversations that we've had with community members. This question had like popped up with um, a couple of people and just community members or friends, people that we were mentoring um, that, and uh, like having an understanding that there are so many resources now um, that can alleviate the contradictions of capitalism, that there wouldn't be a need to like return to the past or kind of like return to the land. Um, and that uh, a lot of these conversations kind of come from uh, these people thinking that, or pardon me, um, like how, understanding how deeply rooted the idea of you only deserve what you work for um, comes into play or kind of like the pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. Um, we were also talking about um, how prisons and the police and other weapons of oppression in the hand of the ruling class can be tools of violence towards us, but in the hands of the working class, they take on a completely different context. Um, and then that kind of like segues into a little discussion that we also had about like the way that China regularly imprisons billionaires shows clearly that in a society that a society in an advanced stage of socialism that is dedicated and prioritized the well being of its people in favor of the working class and the masses, um, as as opposed to the ruling class. Right. Thank you. Preeti, go for it. We also kind of discussed mostly the second one, but I think um, uh, we've, we were discussing how um, uh, in the pre-class society, some, some of us found it interesting that men and women had different roles, but those roles were treated equally. And, uh, uh, and But now in a, in a class society, women's uh, work is unpaid and men's work highly valued and paid because of the relationship uh, mostly to the forces of production. So any work that contributes uh, to profits as valued and reproductive work as undervalued. And, um, and we were also thinking about how, thinking about the timeline of class society, how uh, for most of how, uh, you know, how uh, when human society existed, it was a pre-class society. And that class society is actually a very short span of uh, human history. And the other part, uh, which could be a kind of answering part of question number four, is why is the birth of the state so crucial to understanding is because uh, the, the existence of the capitalist state was essential uh, because the state has a monopoly over uh, violence and to ensure that you know, there will not be any rebellion uh, against the ruling class, it was essential for the state uh, to um, you know, uh, um, uh, engage in um, you know, violent uh, and incarcerate uh, people. And so it's really, an, uh, it's important. So, so the birth of the state as corresponding alongside, of the capitalist state alongside the uh, capitalist society or a ruling class uh, is essential to understanding uh, why abolishing, uh, you know, the, the state is, uh, is, you know, stands side by side with abolishing of the prison system. So that's what we have. Thank you, Preeti. Basil? Yeah, so a lot of what we're talking about focus on pre-class society and its relevance to the present, of course, like the communist future. Um, you know, probably talk about this, you know, like how pre-class society is different from our current society. And, you know, like there was not a material um, need for police due to like that, they're not being like, you know, ex exploitation. Um, and there was like a, you know, as, you know, as was talked about before, like an equitable uh, division of labor. Um, and it really shows, um, has like a, I'm kind of like learning about this is very empowering in that it shows us that like we're capable of making societies that we're like, you know, build together. Um, and, you know, it really challenges this really entrenched idea of the individual as being the center of everything. Um, as opposed to, you know, like collective uh, past that really was like the majority of our past. Um, but also we don't want to like fall into the trap of like, you know, just being like, oh, you know, we need to go back to that. Also like looking at like, what do, you know, what tools do we today? What mean production do we have today that can take us towards a future that, you know, it's not based on scarcity, but abundance. Um, like, you know, like, um, particularly with the Russian Revolution in 1917, you know, 90 percent population. Kind of this, this sets a stage where, like, you know, socialist revolution needs to ensure that, like, you know, um, you know, majority of people 
have you know the, the materials to you know provide for himself it's kind of you know different ideas that we thought amazing thank you so it sounds like we all had like very rich conversations in our base groups and that's really what we wanted we wanted to really start facilitating this discussion about the state the development of the state and how it ties into modern policing and prisons today and that is going to dovetail nicely into tomorrow's class that it's going to be really amazing so we just really want to thank you all for attending class one of party for socialism and liberations digital class series prison abolition a marxist perspective so we hope to see all of you tomorrow for our second and final class abolition a marxist perspective and if you have any other questions or comments, please make sure to email abolitionclass.psl at gmail.com. And I will put that in the chat. Okay. And again, if you have any further questions or comments, just make sure you hit us up in the email, abolitionclass.psl at gmail.com. Tomorrow's class will be at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. 6 p.m. Mountain Time and 5 p.m. Pacific. And we thank you all so much for joining us and we'll see you tomorrow.